Welcome back for Lesson 11, the Renaissance, 1300 to 1600. The Renaissance overlaps with the late Middle Ages, so we're going to look at three different parts today during this time period, the Renaissance. First, we're going to look at the Hundred Years' War and really wrap up the late Middle Ages. Second, we'll look at the Renaissance, and third, we'll look at nation-state building. We have several objectives for Lesson 11, but these are the main ones I want you to focus on today as we talk about this lesson. Outline the major battles of the Hundred Years' War. Explain in detail how the Renaissance was a time of rebirth of ideas and why it began in Italy. Use examples from England, Spain, France, and Italy to show Renaissance work in literature, fine art, architecture, and to show the advancements of new ideas and perspectives. Detail humanism and its role in contributions to ideas of the Renaissance and discuss the political situations in France, Spain, and England and compare these to the city-states and patronage system in Italy. So at the end, we'll talk about what is going on in France, Spain, and England and how they're combining together to become really nation-states. And that's very different from the city-state and patronage system in Italy. So keep that in mind. These are the main objectives. You'll actually learn more about things like the Renaissance in England, Spain, and France, and Italy in your readings as well. So this isn't it. This is just kind of the basic context for the Renaissance. Before we talk about the Hundred Years' War today, I want to back up and look at something we talked about in Lesson 10. The Norman Conquest. In 1066, a man named William from Normandy, which is in modern-day France, will win a battle called the Battle of Hastings in 1066 and he actually takes the crown of england so he is now king of england but he still retains his land in normandy so that means the king of england owns land in france so he controls a large territory in france now he sets up a dynasty and eventually his grandson henry ii will become king of england and he'll rule from 1154 to 1189 and when he rules England, he's also going to try to expand his land and his territory. So he's going to expand his land, especially in France. So England not only controls Normandy and modern-day France, but they also control a lot more of France. And I'll actually show you a map in a moment that will show you all the land that they controlled in modern-day France. Well, Henry II dies, and his two brothers will eventually become king, Richard the Lionheart and John. And so... While Richard the Lionheart and John are king, they are involved in the Crusades, this holy war between Christians and Muslims, and they require England to increase their taxes because they want to fund these massive armies to support the Christian world. So they raise the taxes in England, and while John is king, he's going to become very unpopular. He even has several of his barons rebel against him. And they basically are pushing back. They don't like the taxes. And eventually in 1215, John will actually be forced to sign a document called the Magna Carta. And you looked at the Magna Carta last week, so you know a little bit about it. But the Magna Carta does provide some rights to these English nobility and just Englishmen in general. So we'll take a turn and look at France now. When the Norman conquest of England occurred in 1066, this really opened up an opportunity for the French to try to push to control English occupied territories in France. So the French people wanted to control Normandy, but at the same time, the English are still trying to expand their territory. For instance, Henry II pushed to expand lands in France. So there's this tension between the English and the French that really thrives during this time period. On July 27th, 1214, the French actually win a victory over the English and Germany, and this will allow France to unify under a king called Philip Augustus. And this actually occurs when King John is in power in England, and remember King John was fairly unpopular he was forced to sign the Magna Carta in 1215. Well, one of the reasons he's unpopular is because the lands in France have been lost in 1214. So going back to France, they are now unified in 1214 under a king called Philip Augustus. And he will set up a dynasty. And his grandson will be Louis the Ninth, And he will reign France from 1226 to 1270. And he's going to develop and grow French bureaucracy, so how they manage the French kingdom 
and how they expand and, and control more territory. So we're going to look at a little bit more of these tensions that develop between the English and the French. So this gets us to part one, the Hundred Years' War. It lasts from 1337, and the last battle is fought in 1453. This is a survey class, so we can only hit the high points. We can't spend a ton of time analyzing the Hundred Years' War because there are so many details. But we're going to look at three major battles, and we're going to talk about the main context and the main objectives and points of the Hundred Years' War. So like I said, it starts in 1337. Last battle is fought in 1453. It doesn't officially end until a treaty is signed, but the last battle is 1453. The Hundred Years' War is often called, quote, the culminating military event of the Middle Ages, end quote. But really, we must go back and relate this back to the fact that William the Conqueror, or William Duke of Normandy, he conquered England in 1066, and he became the King of England, but he still had land in France. We know that English kings after him held French properties. Sometimes they held these properties by marriage. Sometimes they fought to keep them, but they controlled them. We know that William's grandson, Henry II, actually expanded land. And so, if we look at this map to the left here, this area in purple is the land controlled by the English before July 1214. They also controlled this red area, Gascony, before 1214. But as we talked about earlier, on July 27th, 1214, the French have a major victory over the English and the Germans, and they really kick the English out of some of their land in France. After 1214, the only land that the English control in France is this territory in red here called Gascony. The other territory that's in purple gets absorbed into a united French kingdom led by a king named Philip Augustus. And so this is what we're talking about. There's tension from 1214 all the way to the 1330s over this land. So let's take a look at the underlying causes and the origins of the Hundred Years' War. So underlying causes. The English want to regain land holdings in France. They're basically pushed down to just Gascony. This is actually a map of France in 1330. And you see they only have this land in Gascony. So they want to regain land holdings that they once had. On the other end, France wants to drive out the English completely. They want them gone from Gascony. There's also an economic issue. There's competition over the wool trade in Flanders. And Flanders is up here at the top of the map. It's modern day Belgium. And so there's competition over this trade for wool with the people in Flanders. The English want to control it and then also the French want to control it. But there are also internal issues including social, economic, and political issues in both England and France. Remember we're under the feudal system and there are a lot of impoverished peasants often called serfs and they're hungry and so there are a lot of economic and social issues going on. And by the first decade of the war you're also going to be introduced to a plague called the black death so there are a lot of issues going on in england and france but what is the immediate cost of the hundred years war the immediate cost is a dispute over the french throne and to understand this immediate cost we must turn to a family tree this is a family tree of the kings of france and we said that the immediate cost of the war is this issue of the French throne. It goes back to a king called Philip III, who ruled from 1270 to 1285. He's married to a woman named Maria. His successor was Philip IV, and he also had a daughter named Margaret of France, who's married to Edward I of England. He has another son. His name is Charles Count of Valois. So let's look at Philip IV. He marries a woman named Joan I of Navarre. Philip IV rules from 1285 to 1314, and he actually has two sons, Louis X and Philip V. Louis X will rule from 1314 to 1316, and he had a son named John. There's an interesting fact about Louis X's son, John I. He was actually born the King of France because his father died before his birth, and he, he was born King of France and he lived from November 15th to November 20th, 1316. So he was 
king from november 15th to november 20th he was actually born king he is the shortest reigning king of france and he was the youngest ruling king of france so when john the first dies louis the tenth didn't have any other heirs so philip the fifth will become king in 1316 and he will rule until 1322 philip the fifth has a son named charles and his son will rule from 13 22 to 1328 is king charles the fourth but king charles the fourth has no male heirs so they are looking for other options who's going to be the next king of france so we have to turn to the english claim remember margaret of france she had married edward the first of england so they had a son named edward the second who ruled england from 1308 to 1327 and he has a male heir named edward the third of england so edward the third becomes king of england in 1322 and he'll rule until 1377 and he believes that he was the heir to the french throne but remember philip the fourth and margaret had another brother charles the count of valois and his line is also going to claim the throne of france for themselves so who's going to be the next king of france will it be edward the third the king of england or a valois cousin so like i said the immediate cost of the war really surrounds this issue of who should be the french king as we pointed out philip the third had another kid that wasn't on that list charles of valois and he has a son named philip of valois and philip of valois is going to be chosen as the next king of france even though he isn't a candidate he's not even a list of the candidates because once the throne passed your lines you aren't supposed to go back if there are other eligible candidates and there was another eligible candidate king edward the third of england really king edward the third of england should be king and so he decides to send a letter in 1337 to the French government saying he was the true king of France. But the French government passes a law saying that the throne of France could not pass through the female line. Edward really feels cheated and he decides to fight for the French throne that he believes is rightfully his. So this is a survey class so we'll only go over the broad outline of the war. We're going to talk about some of the central themes that take place during the war and look at three specific battles so we'll look at the early years of the war first so this is the hundred years war the war is almost completely fought on french soil another thing if we look at the english and french armies they're both commanded by lords and princes remember that they're still in this feudal system where lords are vassals and prince control the militaries there are huge numbers of English and French that fight during this time period. Over 10% of the population of both England and France fight. And when the war broke out, so pre-plague England, the population is about 4 million. So 10% of 4 million fought. And the pre-plague population for France was about 16 million. So 10% of 16 million. So 1.6 million French people fought. Now, if we look at the English army, it's made up of mostly foot soldiers and long bowmen. They are professional and paid fighting force. They're paid for by the king. And for this reason, they're loyal to the king of England. On the other side, you have the French army. And it's mostly made up of cavalry, foot soldiers, and crossbowmen. Now, these soldiers are loyal to and paid for by lords. And those lords are going to be loyal to the king of France. So they're not directly loyal to the king of France. These soldiers are not directly loyal to the king of France. Like the English soldiers are to the king of England. So the first battle we'll look at is called the Battle of Cressy. And it takes place in 1346. It's a one day battle that occurred on August 26, 1346 in northern France. On the English side, you have King Edward III and his son, who is called Edward the Black Prince, and they both led the English troops into this battle. And on the French side, King Philip VI 
and several dukes and counts will command the French troops. King Philip VI was actually wounded in action in this Battle of Cressy. The battle actually starts when King Edward III of England attacks Philip VI. And if we look at each side, the English have around 10 to 15,000 men, and the French had between 20 and 30,000 men. And this battle was really a battle of French crossbows versus English longbows. If we look at crossbows, they're very accurate, but they have a short range. They're also hard and slow to reload. The English had longbows, and longbows are dangerous at 400 yards, and they're very deadly at 100 yards. And they're very quick to reload. Basically, as soon as you could get an arrow out of your quiver and reload it, you could shoot a longbow. So it was a lot quicker than reloading a crossbow. You could actually shoot three longbow arrows for every one crossbow bolt. And the longbow arrows were much more deadly. We also know that there's a shower of arrows that knocked the French cavalry off their horses. And it created mass confusion during this battle. Another thing to add to confusion is cannons are used for the first time on the European battlefield. So this is going to lead to even more confusion. So there's a lot going on in this one day battle and if we look at the tallies and the casualties and losses, the English lost between 40 and 300 soldiers. But the French, they lost 4,000 soldiers. So 4,000 soldiers were killed and out of those 4,000, 1,500 were noblemen. So a lot of the French noblemen died at this Battle of Cressy. So even though the French had a larger number, they lost this battle because they, they had much more casualties. And their crossbows just could not hold up to the English longbow. The next battle I want to talk about is the Battle of Poitiers. And it takes place in 1356. But before I talk about it, I want to remind you that this Battle of Cressy takes place in 1346. So right before the Black Death that we talked about in Lessons 10. Well, this Battle of Poitiers happens after the plague. So we know that when the plague hit, approximately 50% of Europe's population died. So I mentioned some numbers. 4 million English people pre-plague. 16 million French people pre-plague. Well, up to 50% of those people died. So we know that both England and France have a much smaller population by the time that the Battle of Poitiers happens. It occurs on September 19th, 1356. And on one side, you have England, Wales, Gascony, and Brittany. And Brittany is also another uh, French territory. And then on the other side, you have France and Scotland. Leading the English... And their allies was Prince Edward and some of the Dukes. On the French and Scottish side, you have King John II, his son Charles, and other nobles. But, like I said, the, the populations were down. So the size of the military had actually decreased. There were 6,000 on the English side, so English and their allies. And 11,000 on the French and their ally side. King John II of France will actually be captured in this battle. And the French army falls apart. And after the Battle of Poitiers, the old Angevin Empire is recreated. That English kingdom in France, we looked at that map very early on. So that whole purple area in that map we looked at early on will be recreated after the Battle of Poitiers in 1356. As far as casualties and losses go, the English lost 340 men out of 6,000. And the French and Scots lost 2,500. So 2,500 were killed. And then another 1,900 were captured, including King John II, the King of France. So after the Battle of Poitiers, there will be a time of peace for a little while. You do have the English control in this whole western part of France as we know it today. But we're going to skip forward because we're hitting the highlights of the Hundred Years' War. So I want to talk about a battle called the Battle of Angicourt. And it takes place on October 25th, 1415. It's a one-day battle. The English will be led by King Henry V and the Duke of York. And the French will be led by French nobles. The English have between six and 9,000 soldiers. And we know that between 112 and 600 were killed. 
unknown number of wounded. On the French side, there's between 15,000 and 36,000 soldiers, and 6,000 of those soldiers will be killed, and 700 to 2,000 will be captured. One of the people that will be killed during this battle is the Duke of York, so the son of King Henry V. At the end of the day, this battle is a humiliating defeat for France. Within 15 years of this battle at Angers we will see the French reverse some of their losses. So in the 14... 30s, we're going to see some of the losses be re restored. So, the tide of the war is actually turned by a 17 year old shepherd girl named Joan of Arc. She has a vision telling her that the Dauphin or the Prince of France will be the crown king and then France will win this hundred years war. She actually fights her way to Orleans to rescue the prince, Prince Charles, and then she fights her way to the cathedral at Reims to get Prince Charles crowned, and he is crowned King of France. He will become King Charles the Seventh. She continues fighting, and she'll be captured by people from Burgundy, an area of France that is actually loyal to England at the time. And they will actually sell her to the English. And so when they sell her to the English, the English put Joan of Arc on trial as a witch. They say that she's a witch, so they put her on trial as a witch, and she is burned at the stake on May 30th, 1431. Even though she dies, the people of France really rally behind Joan of Arc, because Joan of Arc believed in France. She believed in the King of France, King Charles VII, and she believed that the French could beat the English and push them out of France altogether. So she really encouraged the French to fight and encouraged French pride. So after her death, fighting will continue. And from the 1430s until 1453, the French are going to try to push out the English. And they want to push the English out of France. So they fight and they continue to fight and they take over English control territory little by little. The last battle will actually take place in 1453. And this will be the battle when we see the French really push the English out. So the last battle will take place in 1453, but the war will not officially end until there's a treaty in 1475. One reason that this occurs is England really gets tired of this Hundred Years' War because of the cost. And if we look at England, they're actually going through a war of their own at the time. It's called the War of Roses, and it, it will actually begin in 1455, so two years after the last battle. And they're going through things internally in England, so they don't really have the resources to focus on this far more with France. We'll actually talk more about the War of Roses toward the end of this lesson. Now we'll look at the impacts of the Hundred Years' War. We know that it impacts England and France differently. So we'll first look at the English. Number one, it devastates the English financially. The English are fighting a war in France, so it's very costly to maintain their army. The second thing, almost killed off all noble families. So most of the noble families suffered great loss. Even the Duke of York, the son of the king, is killed in one of the battles. The third thing, one of the causes of this Hundred Years' War was this competition between the English and the French to be involved in the wool trade with Flanders. Well, the Hundred Years' Wars destroyed the wool trade with Flanders, which is modern-day Belgium, and so they no longer have access to this wool trade. The fourth thing is it strengthens English Parliament. At the beginning of the Hundred Years' War, the English king was very powerful. The monarchy had most of the power, but over time, we will see English Parliament gain more power. We'll talk more about this later. The fifth thing is that it leads to the War of Roses. It actually leads to this question of who is the King of England going to be? And we'll talk more about the War of Roses toward the end of this lesson. The sixth thing is it begins overseas expansion. The English have lost their territory in France yet again, and so they start to look for other areas to expand in. And this is really the end of the Hundred Years' War is really at the time when the Asia exploration really takes off. So England will hop in on that, begin to look for overseas expansion. So let's turn and look at the French side. The war was mostly fought on French soil, and the French faced a huge population loss. The second thing is thousands of acres of farmland were destroyed. If you think about fighting a war, it is very devastating to the landscape. And so in this particular war, thousands of acres of farmland were destroyed, and it takes a long time for those lands to heal. Third thing, 
at the beginning of the war people were loyal to their local lords but as the war rocked on especially after joan of arc dies we're really going to see people support the french monarchy more and so the hundred years war is actually going to strengthen the french monarchy the fourth thing we will see is a loss of nobles many of the nobles in france will die during the hundred years war and this is actually going to make the french kings stronger so three and four are tied together really fifth thing is that the french will allow the lower nobility to enter military and government service so we will see some changes in england and france so that's the hundred years war in a very brief quick survey so now we'll look at part two the italian renaissance the renaissance occurs from around 13 to 1600 and the term renaissance is actually a french word that means rebirth so what is really going through a rebirth culture politics there's rebirth in a lot of things during this time period we're really going to see an effort begin to understand ancient learnings from the greeks and the romans so people will actually start to study ancient greek and roman texts the renaissance is also seen as a transition from the medieval era or the middle ages to the modern world and as we know it the renaissance began around present day italy and this is actually a piece of artwork by Raphael. it's called the school of athens and it comes out during the renaissance it's called the school of athens so it's hearkening back to athens and athens was in ancient greece so this kind of shows you how the renaissance artwork is linked to ancient greece and ancient rome but let's talk a little more about the renaissance what actually is the renaissance it's an intellectual movement that began in italy and as i said it lasts from 1300 to 1600. there are several key hallmarks for this renaissance we know that there were extreme hostilities toward the middle ages we also know that the people that are participating in this renaissance are fascinated with ancient rome and greece but who is actually participating in this renaissance the people that are participating in this renaissance are a relatively small group of educated self-conscious elites at first eventually it will spread out to other classes and it will actually spread from italy to other parts of europe so as i said earlier the renaissance really involves returning to learning greek and latin languages and returning to studying these greek and latin art forms and greek and latin texts so why is it starting in italy we should point out that italy is not the italy that we know it today Italy was not united as a country, so it wasn't a nation state, and it wasn't a feudalistic society like other parts of Europe. Italy actually operated as independent city-states, so throughout what we know as modern-day Italy, there were several city-states. Italy at this time period so these different city states had a lot of money one example is the de medici family they lived in the city state of florence and they served as bankers for the catholic church and if you remember from lesson 10 the catholic church was the dominating institution of the middle age they owned land in pretty much all of europe and they collected tithes and so by being the banker for the catholic church the de medici family was very powerful and very wealthy we also know that there's a middle class within these italian city states and they actually want to show off their money by buying nice things this is very different from other european areas that we've talked about because we talked about other areas being part of a feudalistic society there's not a middle class in a feudalistic society so italy's different at the same time italy was urban and so people are close together and ideas could spread rapidly if you lived on a manor in the kingdom of the franks you may not come in contact with other people that frequently well italy is different if you live in florence or if you live in rome people came in contact with one another and these ideas spread really rapidly another thing italy is surrounded by roman ruins so people are looking at them studying them questioning them and that's one of the reasons that the renaissance is going to take place in italy we're going to continue to talk about why italy why is the renaissance in italy as i said in the previous slide italy is made up of city states during the late middle ages and it's not a unified nation state there are actually several different city states you can actually see them here on this map and during this time period so the 1300s to 1600s the italian peninsula was seen as a gateway between europe and asia so italy has a very vibrant and thriving trade network 
and it really started to thrive during the 13th and 14th centuries. And as it continued to thrive, Italian trading cities grew in power. So they continued to grow in power during the 13th and 14th century, and they began to take control of the surrounding countryside. So this is how the city-states really grow and develop. We also know that the Italians were often seen as the bankers of Europe. They finance a lot of things. Some of the Italian bankers even finance one of the Crusades. So the most prominent banker family in Italy at this time is the de' Medici family, but there are a lot of wealthy people in these Italian city-states. These very wealthy people are able to be patrons and they're able to give patronage to artists so they can give artists basically what they need to paint provide them with food and clothing and a little compensation so they can afford to be patrons to the arts give to the artists and allow them to create what they need to create at this time there are five really prominent italian city-states you have the duchy of milan the republic of florence the republic of venice the Papal States, and the Kingdom of Naples. And you can see these five prominent city-states in this particular map here. As far as who controls these different areas, most of the city-states in Italy at this time, not just the five that I named off, are going to be ruled by basically princes or kings and oligarchies. So oligarchies are a few people controlling a particular area, but I can tell you who controls the five most prominent Italian city-states. In Florence, Florence will be ruled by the de Medici family. In Rome, Rome will be ruled by the Pope. The Pope is also known as the Bishop of Rome at this time. The Republic of Venice will be ruled by a group of people called the Doge, and the Doge is elected by the city's aristocracy. If we look at the Duchy of Milan, it will be ruled by a family called the Swartza family, and Naples will be ruled by various kings. Some of the kings of Naples will actually be French families, and Naples will eventually expand into Sicily. So to start with, it's the Kingdom of Sicily, but Naples is going to basically try to expand into Sicily. We know that as time goes on, there is strife and conflict among the Italian city-states, but we also know that a lot of cities are going to be controlled by particular families. As I said earlier, one example was Florence, and Florence being controlled by the de' Medici family, and one Example of one of the leaders in the de Medici family during this time is a man named Cosimo de Medici and he was he was very wealthy He was a banker and he is going to be a patron of artists. He will support artists. Two characteristics of the Renaissance includes individualism and secularism. Renaissance thinkers and creators focused on the individual one great example is the creation of the autobiography. Some of the earliest autobiographies actually came out during the Renaissance. One example is a Spanish noblewoman, a woman named Lenore Lopez de Cordoba, who actually writes about her experience. Other examples include Renaissance artists recording their life. We also know that creators wanted credit for their work during this time period. If a painter painted a painting, they wanted people to know that this was their work. If a sculptor sculpted something, they want people to know that that was their work. So individualism is very important during the Renaissance. Renaissance thinkers and creators want attention. Many of these Renaissance thinkers and creators had extravagant dress, fancy manners, and they had a different level of personal hygiene than your average person in the 13 and 1400s. Renaissance thinkers and creators also indulged in consumerism. What I mean by this is they started purchasing goods and they wanted to show their wealth. So they displayed their wealth and they acquired things to show that they were wealthy. One of the things that they acquire sometimes are paintings. Paintings were actually made more affordable during this time period. Renaissance thinkers and creators embrace quantification. So one example is they quantify time. If they are doing something or exerting energy into a project like painting, they realize that it is their time and they know that time is money. So individualism is really important. Secularism is also important. So not so much focused on religion during secularism. They're focused on being part of the secular world. So they're buying things 
and they're displaying their wealth. So this moves us to talk about another characteristic of the Renaissance. So we've got individualism and secularism, but we also have the philosophy of humanism. So what is humanism? It is the study of the classics to create a new definition of what made man truly human. So these people are trying to study the classics to understand what made man truly human. To be truly human, one had to be educated. You can't just simply exist. Humanists stress the dignity of man because they see man as the best of God's creatures. Humanists look at ancient Roman and Greek texts and they start to reinterpret these ancient Roman and Greek texts without Christian context. So this ties into secularism as well. So they're they're actually stepping outside of this religious context and looking at these ancient Roman and Greek texts and just trying to reinterpret them and understand them without the Christian context. So we will see some retranslation of ancient texts to try to find new meaning. Humanists are also going to encourage people to return to ancient norms and values. Humanists value the study of liberal arts. So liberal arts education is really important to these humanists. One reason that humanists are able to actually study these ancient Roman and Greek texts is the city of Constantinople falls in 1453 to the Islamic people, particularly the Turks, and so many of these ancient texts will be recovered from Constantinople and brought back to what is modern day Italy in 1453. Some of these texts include Plato's and Aristotle's work. We've defined humanism now. So now I want to take a look at three examples of humanism in Europe. So three thinkers that fall into this humanism category. First, I want to talk about the father of humanism, this guy that actually comes up with humanism, that thinks about what it means to be truly human. And his name was Francisco Petrarch, and he's actually seen as the father of humanism. He is the founder of this humanist movement in Italy, and he was actually one of the first collectors and translators of these ancient Greek and Roman writings. And he will actually influence other Italian humanists beginning in the mid-1300s. The second humanist I want to talk about is Dante, and Dante writes the Divine Comedies. It's written between 1308 and 1320, and Dante actually explores human nature, and he talks a lot about sinfulness and the sinful nature of human, and he also examines the soul after death in this Divine Comedy. He actually looks at three different parts, hell, purgatory, and paradise. So that's an example of of another Italian humanist. Third, we'll look at another Italian, a man named Giovanni Boccaccio, and he actually wrote the Decameron. You'll read some of the Decameron for this week's discussion post. It was written between 1348 and 1359, and it actually tells 100 tales that takes place over 10 days about 10 people, 10 young people, that leave Florence during the Black Death. And so these humanists want to understand more about what it means to be truly human. So what else is going on during the Renaissance? Education reform. Students will be encouraged to study ancient texts and liberal arts education flourishes during this time period. Another aspect of education reform is students will be really encouraged to participate in physical education. We can also look at educated women in Italian courts sometimes French courts as well. One example is a lady named Christine de Pizan, and she actually lived from 1364 to 1430. She's a poet. She's originally from Venice, but she'll later move to be a court writer for the French king of Charles VI. But she is actually known as an early feminist, and she will promote education for women as well. So we'll start off looking at Renaissance art and just talk about some of the common themes for Renaissance art. Most art will be purchased by individuals during this time period, and this allowed art to be free of religious themes. If the Roman Catholic Church purchased the art, much of the artwork would be based off religious theme. But during the Renaissance, most art will actually be purchased by individuals, so wealthy individuals, 
and this will free the art from religious themes. So in Italian city-states, if you have people like the Medici family sponsoring or being a patron of the artist, it would allow that artist to, to draw what they want it to outside of religious themes. Renaissance art is also going to focus more on the body. The body will be presented more realistically and scientifically than ever before. And Renaissance artists are really trying to master perception and perspective during this time period. And they're able to do this because there are new technologies that are developing as far as the painting world. Old paintings will come out. And these artists are very experimental in their artwork and they start drawing 3D people. So instead of just a 2D image, they're, they're drawing 3D images. But I want to stress that the Renaissance artists are experimental. Also, artists are interested in making money. An example is Zur, and he will actually do wood block prints. So he'll basically carve out things on wood blocks. They'll put ink on it and press them so they can sell mass numbers of these artistic works. But artists are really interested in making money during the Renaissance. This leads us to two of the most famous Renaissance artists. And these are Italian Renaissance artists. You have Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo. So if we look at the left, we have da Vinci's Mona Lisa. Mona Lisa was a portrait of a woman. It was an old painting on popular panel. So popular is a type of wood. It was painted by Leonardo da Vinci from 1503 to 1506. And it was actually at one point owned by King Francis I of France. And it really highlights some of the Renaissance art styles. Like I said, it was an old painting. It's a painting of a nun's religious topic. It's a painting of a woman. So it's a secular topic. In addition to that, we know Leonardo da Vinci will be very experimental in this painting. What else do we know about da Vinci? Da Vinci is actually very famous and known for several other works. He's from Florence, so he will have patronage in Florence. Uh, he paints several other things, including The Last Supper, which was on this previous slide. You see up at the right, top right, The Last Supper. He also paints a picture called The Virgin of the Rocks. But he's a very experimental painter and he often uses oil paints. If we turn to the right, we will see Michelangelo's David. So this is a sculpture of David from the Bible. Michelangelo was also from Florence. He was a painter, sculptor, and architect. This particular sculpture of David was made from 1501 to 1504. It's 17 feet tall and it was placed in Florence in a public square close to the civic government. It's later moved but it is there on display and we do see that in this particular sculpture Michelangelo is trying to be realistic when he's talking about the human body. He is also very famous for other things such as painting the ceiling of the Sixteen Chapel. So these are two examples of Italian Renaissance artists. Michelangelo is also an architect and one of the projects he'll work on with several others is called St. Peter's Basilica and St. Peter's Basilica will be built in the Vatican so in Rome and it will be started so they start construction in 1506 and it will be constructed in a Renaissance style you can see here the style this is one of the main entrances of this church the St. Peter's Basilica and it is in this Renaissance style so you can look at it and see that it is influenced by ancient Roman and Greek architecture as well. It takes a very long time to complete St. Peter's Basilica. It will be completed on November 18th 1626 so it takes approximately 120 years to build this church. It is still in use today. So what else is going on during this time of the Italian Renaissance? In 1494, Naples prepared to invade Milan. So there's tension between the city-state of Naples and the city-state of Milan. In return 
Milan knows that Naples may invade them, so Milan invites France to take claim of the throne in Naples in 1495. Then we'll see the League of Venice convene and try to quell this French invasion of Italy. And so the French king, French king Charles the Eighth will retreat. But the French return in 1499 under a new leader, Louis the Twelfth. By 1500, Naples will be divided between two different, what we would consider, kingdoms. The Kingdom of France and the Kingdom of Aragon, which is in present day Spain. So the Pope actually steps in. And at this time, the Pope is Pope Julius II. And he forms something called the Holy Roman League, in October 1511 in an attempt to push the French out of Italy by 1512. What happens is the French simply invade again, and what finally settles everything is they eventually come up with this thing called the Concordiate of Bologna, and the Concordiate basically says that the Pope could collect all the income that the Catholic Church makes in France. On the other hand, the King of France had the right to nominate appointments for positions like the Archbishop, Bishops, Abbots in, in France. So that's the Concordat of Bologna, and this happens because the French invade Italy. Around this time period, we will see a Renaissance thinker. His name is Nicola Machiavelli, and he writes something called The Prince. Machiavelli lives from 1469 to 1527, and he is influenced by the Renaissance and the world around him. So Machiavelli lives in what we would call modern-day Italy. He believes that Italy could unite under a leader that would unite the entire of Italy, and that that leader could unite them by using fear and terror. He actually favors the de' Medici family. And so he writes a book, but it's really like a letter, and it's called The Prince. The Prince is actually written to the de Medici, and particularly a prince in the de Medici family. It's filled with harsh advice, including murder, betrayal, and intrigue. He actually encourages the prince to do whatever it takes to stay in power and to gain the people's trust. Uh, basically, he wants the prince to overtake all of Italy by using whatever it takes. He actually has a quote that says, it is better to be feared than loved. He really thinks it's best to be feared and loved, but if you have to choose one, he thinks fear is better because you could get people to do what you needed them to do. His work, The Prince, is actually considered one of the first works of political science. Now, he lives until 1527, Machiavelli does, and his goal of having a united Italy under one leader does not happen during his lifetime. So now we're going to shift gears and look at the Northern Renaissance. When we talked about Italy, we were talking about the Southern Renaissance. So when we compare the Northern Renaissance versus the Southern Renaissance, when we're talking about the Southern Renaissance, we're talking about Italy. When we're talking about the Northern Renaissance, we will be talking about other countries like England. So we're looking at the Northern Renaissance and Renaissance life. So why did the Renaissance spread? It started out in Italy. Why does it spread? One example is that students carried their ideas north with them. So people that have learned in Italy, even some Italian students, will go north and they'll spread their ideas. We also know that there have been invading armies from Aragon, which is modern-day Spain, and France, and this is really going to influence some of these soldiers that are invading Italy, and they will bring ideas that they learn about the Renaissance back with them to Spain and France. We also see movable type emerge during this time period, and this is actually an image of movable type, but you can print things a lot quicker with movable type. When we talked about Lesson 10, we talked about monks hand copying Bibles and religious texts, and that's how they made new books. Well, now, during this time period, we will see more access to the movable type. We actually see the emergence of the first printing press in Europe called the Gutenberg Printing Press, 
and it emerges in 1445. And with movable type and new printing presses, it's really going to make books cheaper and more accessible to people throughout Europe. Now, your everyday peasants probably cannot afford books during this time period. They really can't. But books are going to be cheaper and they're going to be more available than they were previously. So, we're going to look at differences between the Northern and Southern Renaissance. And remember, when we're talking about the North, we're talking about other parts of Europe. When we're talking about the South, we're really looking at the Italian Renaissance for our case and purpose. So, in Italy, or in the Southern Renaissance, we really had patrons, so these wealthy families, that sponsored artists and allowed them to create sculptures, paintings, and whatnot. So, they were wealthy elites in the South. In the north, patrons are going to be kings. So, for instance, the French kings will be patrons of the art. So, it's going to be kings, not wealthy elite. We also know in the north, there's going to be more focus on Christianity. Now, when we were looking at Italy, it was secularism. And people were trying to understand these ancient Greek texts and ancient Roman texts without the context of religion. But if we look at the north... It's going to be more Christian. They're going to analyze and edit ch early church works and not gr Greek and Roman works. And the people that are involved in this renaissance in the north are going to come from different social backgrounds. So varied social backgrounds. Not all of them will be wealthy. And they're actually more common. And they're actually more willing to write for the common people. So we'll look at some of those examples as well. So we've talked about this concept of humanism in the Southern Renaissance, so the Italian Renaissance. Now we need to look at it in the context of this Northern Renaissance. And to do that, we'll look at Erasmus. He's a Dutch philosopher and a Christian scholar. And he actually wants to blend traditional Christianity with humanism. To do this, he plans to mix patience, calmness, and broad-mindedness with love, faith, and hope. So he's trying to understand what makes humans truly human within this framework of traditional Christianity and humanism. So he attempts to reform religion by preparing new editions of the New Testament, and he also believed in education. So we looked at several Italian humanists, so Southern Renaissance humanists, if we look at the Northern Renaissance humanist, Erasmus is the most important Northern Renaissance humanist. Now we'll shift gears and look at Northern Renaissance art. We've already looked at Italian Renaissance art. We looked at a few examples like Da Vinci and Michelangelo, but there were others like Raphael. But now let's take a look at Northern Renaissance art. So most of the Southern Renaissance art took away religious elements. But Northern Renaissance art, it does retain some religious elements. For instance, you'll see some paintings still showing people in the prayer pose. As far as architecture goes, instead of Renaissance architecture, we really see Gothic architecture in the Northern Renaissance. So town halls will be constructed, and these town halls will be constructed to look like many cathedrals. Now, as far as paintings, in the Northern Renaissance, they will almost exclusively be oil paintings. A, a, a German named Dürer who does wood prints, and I mentioned him once before, but basically wood prints would be carved out on a piece of wood. They'd be dipped in ink or ink would be put on them and they would be transferred. And so he was very famous for this method. And this is actually a work down at the bottom of Drew. Then you have a group of Flemish artists that paint portraits. And one example is a man named Brogel. And he really focuses on perspective. So showing this perception and perspective. But he also uses new color palettes. So the Renaissance art is really experimental because, for instance, he's using new color palettes, which had never been done before. So Renaissance art is very experimental move from renaissance art to talking about renaissance life now before the 1500s it's just the catholic church but by 
the second decade of the 1500s, we see the emergence of a Protestant church. So, I've broken it down into Catholics versus Protestants, looking at marriage. As far as Catholics go, men needed significant land before they married. This means that men would marry later in life. So, it means later marriages. Sometimes, you will see a wealthy widow that actually marries a younger man. And this is one way that a, a man is able to marry at a younger age. As far as Catholics go, divorce did not exist. Marriage was actually very easy to do during this particular time period. If you were Catholic, it was a oral promise. So basically people just promised themselves together before God and they and themselves. So that's an oral promise. And there will be lots of grievances within marriages during this time period. If we look at the Protestants that emerged in the 1500s, Marriage will be praised as a noble undertaking. The Protestants believe that marriage actually liberated women, and some people believe that it's better than being a nun. The Protestants do allow divorce because marriage is not seen as one of the holy sacraments in the Protestant religion, and it is seen as one of the holy sacraments in the Catholic religion. Contraception will be allowed, but during this time period, it's... It's, it's very primitive contraception, so it's only like 70% effective. So there are a lot of children being born during this particular time period. So this leads to family size during Renaissance life. Now we can talk about family size during the Renaissance. Pregnancy happened much more often than it did today. So women have about a 30-year childbearing capacity and children will be delivered every 24 to 30 months so pregnancy happens a lot during the renaissance time period so from 1300 to 1600 these women had a 10 chance of death from childbirth so it was really risky high maternal and infant mortality rates during this time period city-born babies are less healthy during the renaissance than country-born babies because these cities were filthy. As I said, families were very large because mothers were bearing children for about 30 years. They had a child every two to two and a half years. So there are a lot of children in these families. If they had extra daughters that they could not marry to someone, their extra daughters would be sent to convents to become nuns. And this is actually a Renaissance portrait of a woman called LaDonna. And she's actually pregnant. You can see that she has her hands on her stomach here. Another aspect of Renaissance life was witchcraft and witchcraft trials. And we don't really have a ton of time to go into it, but witchcraft craze really happens during this time period. And it sometimes pits women against women. They will basically claim that these women are witches for their own political purposes. We know that in Europe, from 1450 to 1625, over 200,000 people will be killed as witches. Out of that 200,000, 85% of them were women. And so women no longer trusted each other during this time period because your neighbor may claim that you're a wit because they use this for their political advantage. And some of these ideas about witchcraft do carry over to colonies as you probably remember in your U.S. history classes, you see the Salem Witch Trials a little bit later, but they do have a historical basis from these witchcraft trials in Europe. Joan of Arc, who we've already talked about today, she was tried as a witch. What about Renaissance food? What would it be like to eat during the Renaissance? So... People did preserve their food during this time period, but it was either dried or salted. One example of a food that these people ate a lot of is herring. It's a type of fish. It's eaten often during this time period. It would often be salted, so it's going to be a very salty fish. The people would try to eat fresh crops when they're available, but they're only available from late spring to early autumn so many of the crops will be dried an example is beans and beans will be cooked with meat and they cook the beans with meat to help absorb some of the salt 
that is in the meat that is preserved the meat. They also introduce some sauces into Renaissance food. They have a yellow sauce that includes ginger and saffron and a green sauce that included ginger, clove, and other herbs. But they don't have a red sauce because tomatoes are not in Europe at this time. So they do have sauces. They also use pepper. Pepper is really important during this time period. It's often even used as currency. So their their diet does have some variety to it, but not as much as a post-Columbian exchange diet in Europe. So this leads us to them actually eating this food. If we look at table manners during the Renaissance, they have very poor table manners. People do not eat with forks because they could be used as dangerous weapons during this time period. Everyone is eating with their hands and they they just eat kind of like uncivilized manner at this time period. Everyone's actually going to wash their hand before they touch the meat but they're just eating with their hands and while they're sitting there at the table they don't have the best personal hygiene. So they have fleas and lice and they're scratching and eating and it's a messy scene. You can even see trash in this portrait here on the ground as they sit around the table and eat. So table manners are not necessarily up to par for modern standards. What are some other changes during this time period? Warfare will change. We will see larger armies form. If you remember during the Middle Ages, most of the armies are made up basically a lord would recruit knights and soldiers to fight for him, and they would fight for the king. Well, now we will see large armies form that are fighting specifically for a particular kingdom or nation. We also see gunpowder and cannons begin being used in Europe. Conscription will be common during this time period, so they will actually conscript men to serve for the army. And these armies become really large, and it's really expensive to maintain these armies. And if you take World History 2, you'll learn more about these large armies and how expensive these large armies are to maintain as you move forward from the 1400s and look forward in like the 15 and 1600s. Another thing that's really important during this time period is the printing press. Movable type will replace block print and you'll have reusable letters. So it makes it a lot quicker to print things. And Gothic script will be abandoned for a type of script called the Carolingian Minuscule. And books will become cheaper to produce. And if books are cheaper to produce, they can make more, they can sell more, and ideas spread faster. We also see the invention of page numbers. So you can keep place with where you are in your book. So those are some of the changes and things that take place during Renaissance life. And so this leads me to our last part. Part 3, Nation Building in Europe. Nation State Building will really begin in the 15th century or the 1400s in Europe. We will see a decline in fragmented feudalism and we'll really see the rise in monarchies after 1450. So monarchies will control their kingdoms and they will be very powerful after 1450. The king will have the power to attack, wage war, and manage laws and they will increasingly have more power after 1450. This is part of the centralizing and centralization of these governments in Europe. And the level of power that lords and vassals have change. Kings actually have more power during this time period. But how does the vassal power change? Some of these lords will be sent to representative assemblies. Like if you think about parliament in England, some of the people that serve in these representative assemblies are going to be lords. We also see national armies created. So these large national armies, an army that fights for the king of England, an army that fights for the king of France. So we'll briefly talk about Russia becoming a nation. Russia is invaded in 1223 by the Mongols. And eventually we will see the fall of a... Russian city called Kiev in 1240. And so after this, Russian cities had to pay tribute to the Mongol Empire. Over time, the princes of Moscow or Moscow worked with the Mongols for a period of time. But by 1380, so 140 years, they've been paying these 
tributes to the Mongol Empire. By 1380, the Grand Duke, a man named Dmitri of Moscow, will defeat the Mongols. And when he does this, Mongol control will decline in Russia for the next 100 years. In 1480, Ivan the Great united northern Russia, and Moscow will really become the dominant Russian city. And the Mongols are pushed out. So this is really the beginning of Russia and the Russian nation-state as we know it today. France. At the end of the Hundred Years' War, which we talked about at the beginning of this lecture, England lost control of land in France. In addition, land from the Duchy of Burgundy will be absorbed into France after the defeat of Charles the Bold in 1477. And these two factors set the stage for Louis XI to build the French monarchy and to really set up this nation of France. Later, France would invade Italy in the 1490s and they're going to try to take over part of Italy as well. We've already mentioned this if you go back a couple of slides. So France is set up as a nation. The king of France is really building his army and expanding France as a nation and setting up this monarchy, this dynasty. Moving on to Spain. The last time we mentioned Spain in this lecture, we said Aragon. Aragon was actually a part of Spain. It was a kingdom in Spain. So if we look at medieval Spain, it's divided into kingdoms. By the mid-1400s, the two strongest kingdoms were still competing for power. You had the kingdom of Castile, kingdom of Aragon. But we will see these two kingdoms come together in 1469 when two people marry. We will see the marriage of Isabella and Ferdinand in 1469 the two kingdoms will still be kept separate so there will still be a kingdom of castile and a kingdom of aragon but they could focus on uniting the country and the two of them focused on uniting the country by using religion and the religion they used was catholicism they actually focus on pushing islamic people out of spain and uniting Spain around the Catholic banner. This is actually called the Reconquista, which we'll talk more about toward the end of this class and also in world history too. It will also be under Ferdinand and Isabella that Christopher Columbus will sail in search of a route to the Indies, and he will actually land in the Americas, particularly in the Bahamas, and we will see a Spanish empire emerge in the 1500s and in Latin America. And eventually, the two kingdoms will come together and we will see Charles I or Charles V. And he will become a king to start with. He'll be the king. And eventually, he's going to create an empire called the Habsburg Empire. And he will actually become the Holy Roman Emperor as well. So Spain is going to really start to be seen as a nation and begin to unite under Isabella and Ferdinand. So now we'll look at England. The last time we talked about England, we were looking at the Hundred Years' War. And the Hundred Years' War left England in chaos. There were several noble families that lost sons, fathers, the king even lost his son, the Duke of York. It really creates internal fighting within the royal family in England. And there are actually two houses within the royal family in England at the time. The House of York, and they're represented by the White Rose Badge. And the House of Lancaster, and they're represented by the Red Rose. It will actually lead to a war called the War of the Roses. And it takes place from 1455 to 1485. And there will be a series of battles, and basically they're fighting to see who will control the English throne. And there will be several kings. The first king we're really going to talk about is a Lancastrian king. His name is Henry VI. He's actually sickly for most of his life. He rules from 1422 to 1461, and he's deposed of, so he's kicked out as king. He's not killed, but he's kicked out as king. And so fighting is going to occur. He really wants to regain control. But 
In 1461, a York monarch takes over. His name's King Edward IV, and he will rule from 1461. But there is a short period of time when Edward IV loses power, and this takes place in October 1470. Henry VI comes back in power from October 1470 to April 1471. But after April 1471, Edward IV is back in power, and he's going to continue to rule from 1471 to 1483. When Edward IV dies, eventually his brother Richard III will become king. He rules from 1483 to 1485. One reason that this occurs is because two of Edward's two of Edward IV's sons, their young princes, and they're murdered. They're called the princes in the tower. They're murdered. So this means that Edward the Fourth's brother becomes king. Um, so Edward the Fourth's brother Richard becomes king from 1483 to 1485. And, you know, there's a York king on the throne, and the Lancastrians really believe a Lancaster should be on the throne. And this was really where Henry Tudor is going to emerge. He is in the Lancastrian line, and he believes that, you know, he has a right to the throne, and he will fight and kill Richard the Third at the Battle of Bosworth Field, and so he will defeat Richard the Third. And when he defeats Richard the Third, he will later marry Richard the Third's niece, who is Edward the Fourth's daughter. Her name's Elizabeth. So Henry Tudor and Elizabeth marry, and when they marry, they unite the House of York, and they unite the House of Lancaster together. Because Elizabeth is York, Henry Tudor is linked to the Lancaster, and they unite together. They form their own house, the House of Tudor. Its badge is a white rose inside of a red rose, and this is going to set up the Tudor dynasty. And their son is actually going to be Henry VIII. We'll also see other people that are part of this Tudor dynasty, including Mary the First and Elizabeth. And this is really going to be the beginning of the English modern nation state. So what are our conclusions about this time period, 1300 to 1600s? We've talked about the Hundred Years War, the Renaissance, and nation state building. We know that the Renaissance is a time for rebirth. We even see a rebirth in politics and the way that things are taking place during this time period. We see a rebirth in scholarship and art. We see new knowledge and rediscovery of ancient Greek and Roman works. And we know that this knowledge spreads from Italy throughout Europe. And humanism thrives in Europe. It starts in Italy. So in the Southern Renaissance, we see humanism, people trying to understand what makes people truly human. And then in the North, we see people trying to understand this too, but they try to understand it in a Christian context. One thing that the Renaissance does is it led to self-realization for individuals. So individualism is also occurring. So these are our conclusions. We will pick up next week with Lesson 12.